Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this year's Brick Court Commercial Law Conference, Jurisdiction Battles in Commercial Disputes. For those who don't know me, and there are probably many of you here who don't, my name is Richard Aikins. I left the Court of Appeal four years ago, almost to the day, and I came back to Brick Court, where I practiced as a barrister, in order to work as an arbitrator. And I'm delighted and honored to introduce this conference this afternoon. London has long been a center for transnational litigation and arbitration. Every day, there are cases in the commercial court or the business and property courts where the parties have nothing to do with the UK other than that they have agreed or sometimes been forced to litigate in London. Down the road at the LCIA, similarly, there are London arbitrations taking place where the parties will not be UK companies or nationals or resident here every day of the week. But there are challenges to English jurisdiction, whether it be in the context of litigation or arbitration. Much of the litigation work of law firms and commercial sets of chambers, not least brick court chambers, is taken up in dealing with enforcing jurisdiction or making challenges to it. Inevitably, this area of the law is always developing and often developing fast. As an example, hot off the press yesterday is the Court of Appeals decision in PJSC Privat Bank and Kolmoyski, which you will hear about in the course of this afternoon. So it seems to me that it is very appropriate that this year's conference is about topics concerning this threshold issue of jurisdiction. I'm personally very pleased that this area has been chosen this year because I am the person on the editorial team of Dicey, Morris and Lawrence who is in charge of the chapter on jurisdiction. So I hope to be able to catch up with all the latest cases from the talks that we're about to hear. We start off in session one with issues concerning jurisdiction in litigation. First, a review of where the courts are now on the so-called good arguable case test for establishing a jurisdictional gateway. This is a real lawyer's argument. When is a good arguable case not a good arguable case? Well, we used to say, when you don't have the better of the argument. Helen Davis, QC, will tell us whether that is still so. When there are several defendants and one is resident or domiciled in the UK and is the so-called anchor defendant, what are the tests then that are required for jurisdiction? This arises in many cases involving claims against companies in groups, whether in the context of personal injury, Vedanta, or cartel cases, MSH and Toshiba and Panasonic. Sarah Abram will talk about this. Daniel Jowell QC will look at issues arising under the Brussels I recast regulation and the Lugano Convention 2007. In particular, he will examine two problems. First, what happens when there is an exclusive jurisdiction clause in favor of a non-EU Lugano state court, but proceedings have been started in England. Secondly, and this is where PJSC Privat Bank comes in, whether under the Lugano Convention, the right to join defendants to a case where the anchor defendant is domiciled in England is subject to a restriction that this right cannot be exercised when the, quotes, sole object, close quotes, of joining the anchor defendant is to enable foreign defendants also to be joined. Charlotte Thomas will then tantalize us with what the jurisdictional landscape might look like, quotes, after Brexit, close quotes. If there is a Brexit, of course, who knows? There's no white or even black smoke coming out of Brussels at the moment. At the end of session one, there will be tea in the reading room, so please make your way down there then, and we hope that will be about half past three. In session two, there are three more topics for discussion, 
first focusing on arbitration. Anti-suit injunctions in support of English arbitration is the first topic, and Richard Lord QC will talk about issues of delay, voluntary submission, and the concept of comity in relation to anti-suit injunctions. Jasbir Dillon will then discuss the issues that arise when there is a complex jurisdiction and arbitration clause in relation to the recent Perkins Engines and Gadar case. State participation in commercial arbitrations is increasing. That brings with it possible or perhaps probable claims for immunity at any stage in the arbitral process from the question of establishing jurisdiction of the tribunal to enforcement of the award. Jonathan Dawid will examine some of these problems. Lastly, Zara al rikati will examine some issues which arise in connection with service of proceedings through the Hague Convention mechanisms. After that, you'll all be exhilarated, of course, but perhaps also anxious to discuss these matters over a drink. Please join us downstairs for a drink in the Vulliami Lounge. Well, I hope you have a very good afternoon and it's useful and enjoyable. May I remind you, please, to turn off your mobile phones or at least turn them to silent. Thank you. Helen Davis will start. Thank you, Richard. Now, the good arguable case test was established as long ago as 1951 as the standard that was to be applied in considering whether one of the jurisdiction, jurisdictional gateways uh, applied uh, pursuant to which the English court could assert jurisdiction over someone who is outside the jurisdiction of the English court, or at least arguably so. But the meaning and application of that test in cases where there are disputed facts or issues going to jurisdiction has been the subject of recent extensive judicial consideration and development, as I shall seek to explain during the course of my talk. The background, of course, is that jurisdictional disputes are usually to be determined on the basis of written evidence alone, so there's no disclosure, no cross-examination, and moreover, as Lord Templeman observed in the Spiliada, jurisdiction challenges should be measured in hours and not days. Guidance, which I'm sure we're all aware, is increasingly disregarded. Jurisdictional challenges often involve masses of documents, long statements, detailed analysis, and long argument, notwithstanding the more recent warning against all of the above by Lord Neuberger in VTB, and, um, well, in VTB in 2013. So, all of that means that in order to establish whether there is a um, jurisdictional gateway that applies, one would hope that there was a simple test to be applied. And the test we know, as we've been told, is the good arguable test. And we were told by the Court of Appeal in Canada Trust and Stolzenberg in 1998 that that meant that the claimant seeking to establish jurisdiction had to show that it had much the better of the argument. One would have thought quite a high hurdle. However, no longer so. The one thing that is certain in light of the recent authorities, starting with Brownlee and Four Seasons Holdings in 2017, is that much the better of the argument is no longer the correct test. Because, as Lord Sumption said, albeit Obiter in that case, that wrongly suggested a superior standard of conviction that is both uncertain and unwarranted. So, it means the better of the argument. So far, so good. Uh, Lord Sumption went on in Brownlee and Four Seasons to explain that that was a serviceable test, provided, and this is the important proviso, that it was correctly understood. So he then sought to explain how we should all understand it. And it means that we now have three limbs to apply. What it means. First of all, limb one. The claimant must supply a plausible evidential basis for the application of the relevant jurisdictional gateway. That one, relatively easy to understand. Limb two. 
If there is an issue of fact about it or some other reason for doubting whether it applies, the court must take a view on the material available if it can, re if it can reliably do so. So by reference to the written material before it, it has to try and take a view whether the claimant has the better of the argument. But limb three is the important one in this context. The nature of the issue and the limitation of the material available at the interlocutory stage may be such that no reliable assessment can be made, in which case there is a good arguable case for the application of the gateway if there is a plausible, albeit contested, evidential basis for it. I'll come back to that because that's been explained further in some subsequent cases. Now, in the same case in Brownlee, Baroness Hale said the test is good arguable case, simple, and glosses should be avoided. And she also said that she didn't think Lord Sumption's explication of the test uh, glossed it. Well, Lord Sumption obviously doesn't agree because in Col Goldman Sachs International, which is not obiter, so this is, is determinative, uh, he explained that he had reformulated the good arguable case uh, in the three limbs that I just referred to on the previous slide. That's what the Supreme Court have said about it. It simply is those three limbs with no real explanation of how those two are to apply. The whole question then came before the Court of Appeal in a case called Kaifer and an unpronounceable name, so I won't try it, AMS Drilling Mexico earlier this year, where one can see what the Court of Appeal uh, made of it by the comments, first of all, of Lord Justice Green, that the test is intended to be straight, that was intended to be straightforward has become befuddled by glosses, glosses upon glosses, explications and reformulations. And Lord Justice Nigel Davis explained that he was in something of a fog as to the difference between an explication and gloss. Nonetheless, the Court of Appeal added yet further explication in the judgment of Lord Justice Green. Because what he sought to do was to try and make sense of the new reformulated test. And this really, at the moment, is the best word, therefore, on what this new reformulated test means. So as he explained, a plausible evidential basis in limb one equals an evidential basis showing that the claimant has the better of the argument. Again, as I said a moment ago, that's relatively straightforward to understand. Limb two, also actually relatively straightforward to understand, is an instruction to the court to overcome evidential difficulties and arrive at a conclusion if it reliably can, applying judicial common sense and pragmatism, not least because the exercise is intended to be one conducted with due dispatch and without oral evidence. So courts, do the best you can on the basis of the evidence, uh, applying both your common sense and pragmatism. Again, relatively straightforward. It's limb three where things get somewhat more complicated because that is intended to deal with the situation where the court finds itself simply unable to form a decided conclusion, so it can't reach a view, and it's not able to say who has the better of the argument, so it's not able to say that the claimant, of course, upon whom the burden applies in relation to this, has the better of the argument, where uh, Lord Justice Green in Kaifa says, well, what the Supreme Court has done in Brownlee and Goldman Sachs is to introduce a flexible test combining the good arguable case and plausibility of the evidence, which is not necessarily conditional upon relative merits. Uh, and he, did, he supplemented that explanation by explaining that in appropriate cases, it would effectively be unfair to conclude on the basis of contested material uh, that the court does not have jurisdiction, particularly if the contested material is material that also goes to the substance of the dispute. So you, in this third area, where you just can't tell who's got the better of the argument, you have, as per Brownlee, to um, determine whether or not there is a plausible, albeit contested, evidential basis. So that's where the higher courts have left things. Uh, Kaifa was only decided earlier this year, uh, and there have been a few cases in the commercial court since then seeking to apply it. Uh, one of which is a decision of one of our colleagues, Mr. Andrew Henshaw QC, sitting as a deputy, in which he had to apply uh, this approach in, re 
respect of a dis the existence of a disputed oral agreement, part of the oral agreement being um, a jurisdiction agreement in favour of England. That's a case called Coward, uh, which was decided in July of this year. He concluded, uh, on the basis of all the evidence before him, that the good arguable case test had not been satisfied. I just mention it so you're aware of it. I'm now going to move on to a case in which the commercial court actually concluded that the good arguable test was satisfied because there's a bit more analysis of Kaifa in it, which is a case um, called Tugashev and Orlev. It's a dispute between uh, several parties, one of whom the claimant, Mr. Tugashev, alleges that uh, he was a partner with two of the defendants in relation to one of the largest fishing businesses in the world. It's been referred to in the press as Cod Wars, hence the heading. Now, Mrs. Justice Carr, uh, faced with, in fact, a, I think in the end we had about eight days worth of jurisdiction challenge, uh, said it was important not to overcomplicate what should be a straightforward test to be applied sensibly to the particular facts and issues arising in each individual case. Uh, and she emphasized that whatever perorations there were along the way, the ultimate test remains one of a good arguable case, which means, as we all know, having the better of the argument. And that, she thought, conferred a desirable degree of flexibility in the evaluation of the court. Although she also, of course, acknowledged that the test had to be understood by reference to the new reformulated three-limb test identified in Brownlee. Now, in Tugashev, one of the key issues was whether Mr. Tugashev had a good arguable case that Mr. Orlov was resident in the jurisdiction when Mr. Orlov had served extensive sworn evidence from multiple deponents that he lived in Murmansk and that his property in London was an investment property or a private hotel, which he only visited for intermittent business purposes. Another version of the uh, Abramovich and Deripaska cases that many of you are no doubt familiar with. Uh, what's interesting, perhaps, about what Mrs. Justice Carr decided is that she concluded it wasn't necessary for Mr. Tugashev to put forward positive evidence in order to succeed. Uh, it was possible to show a good arguable case which could at least partly be done through ever inference. Uh, and she went on to go through various items of evidential, effectively, inference, so the defendants at least would say, to conclude that actually Mr. Tugashev had met each of the three limbs of the Brownlee test. Uh, the material that was before the court uh, did not meet, I think it's fair to say, any of the VTB um, uh, guidance from Lord Neuberger. It was extensive, it was detailed, there was long argument. Uh, there was detailed uh, analysis of the movements of Mr. Orlov through the key periods, uh, the movements of his uh, partner through the key periods, the uh, visa status of both of them, and so on and so forth. And it was that material that allowed Mrs. Justice Carr to reach the conclusion that the three limbs of uh, the Brownlee test had each been satisfied. Uh, and so one of the things that's of interest in this context, if we have this three limb test, which includes at limb three, a question of showing plausible, albeit contested evidence, to what extent will that encourage parties to actually continue down the route of overloading the court on jurisdiction challenges as opposed to simplifying them uh, as per the guidance in Spiliada and VTB. That's really it from me. I'm just going to finish with uh, a Mail Online um, headline in relation to that case, because it's not very often that commercial cases get into the mail. You can see that they were not that worried about the niceties of the Brownlee test, but they did summarise the result with apologies to McFarland's. <laughs> now to turn to anchor defendants. In October 1997, as autumn began and the days were drawing in, Andrew Wusu, a British man who was domiciled in the UK, decided to take a late summer holiday to Jamaica. He rented a luxurious villa, complete with private beach, sounds rather nice, from a Mr Jackson, who was also domiciled in the UK. While he was there, Mr Wusu dived into the Caribbean Sea. That's where it went wrong. His head struck a submerged sandbank and he broke his back, leaving him with a life-changing injury. He brought proceedings in the English courts 
against Mr Jackson, who was domiciled here, and several other defendants as well. All of the other defendants were Jamaican domiciled. Mr Jackson, although he was English domiciled, said England isn't the appropriate forum for the claim against him and invited the English court to stay the proceedings. That gave rise to what we now recognise as the classic Awusu question. Can an English domiciled anchor defendant say that England isn't the appropriate forum for a claim against it to be heard? Spoiler alert, the European Court of Justice ruled that in the circumstances of that case, an English defendant like Mr Jackson was prevented by the Brussels jurisdictional regime from making a forum non-convenience challenge. Now, as many of you will recall from the time, a lot of commentators bemoaned the European Court sticking its nose into litigation that concerned parties and facts in the UK and Jamaica, no other European countries. There are obvious Brexit jokes to be made there, but I'm going to try and hold myself back. So far as Awusu was concerned, the die was cast, and since the ruling of the ECJ in that case in 2005, as we all recognise, suing an anchor defendant domiciled in this country has been an incredibly powerful tool to establish the jurisdiction of the English courts. And I think it's worth exploring two particular aspects of that in the light of recent cases. They pull in different directions. The first that I'll talk about weakens the gravitational force fields that surrounds an anchor defendant under a WUSU, and the second arguably strengthens it. So to start with the challenge to the dead weight of the anchor defendant, that comes from the Supreme Court in Lungo against Vedanta. Many of you will uh, know all the facts, but I'll just give a quick recap. Some 70 years before Mr. Owusu set off for his fateful holiday, the Unchanga copper mine was developed in Zambia. It's now the second largest open cast mine in the world. Fast forward to the present day, and almost 2,000 Zambian citizens have brought a claim in the English courts arguing that the mining operations in the Inchanga mine have led to the pollution of watercourses from which they and their livestock drink and which they use to irrigate their crops. They issued the claim in the English courts against the Zambian company that owns the mine and against, and here's the anchor defendant, the English domiciled ultimate parent company of the mine operating company. The defendants challenged jurisdiction. Zambia is obviously outside the Brussels system, so the Zambian defendant could bring a forum non-convenience challenge. But Awusu doesn't allow that challenge to be made by the English defendant. Now, this gives rise to a problem for defendants in, um, in these kind of challenges, because even if the England isn't the proper forum for the claim against the Zambian defendant, there's a risk of irreconcilable judgments if the proceedings against the anchor defendant continue in England and the proceedings in, against the Zambian defendant might go, might go off somewhere else. Since Awusu, that risk has been almost a trump card for claimants in um, informed non-convenience challenges. The non-anchor defendant may have the most compelling arguments imaginable that the proper forum for the litigation against it is not the UK, it's some other country. But because Awusu means that the anchor defendant can't make the same challenge, the claimant says, well, look, some of the litigation is inevitably going to have to be heard in England. So they see off the jurisdiction challenge because the court just can't contemplate the idea of two, two judicial processes in different countries, two trials, and possibly irreconcilable judgments, so the risk of different outcomes at the end of it. On that, Vedanta is potentially a game changer. The English domiciled parent company in that case said, well, look, in order to avoid a risk of irreconcilable judgments, we'll submit to the jurisdiction of the Zambian courts. So all of the litigation can just happen in Zambia. In previous cases, courts have said, well, that doesn't help. They say the starting point is that the claimant has the right to sue an anchor defendant in England. The claimant's exercising that right. So there's a risk of irreconcilable judgments. So goes the previous logic. The fact that the anchor defendant will submit to the jurisdiction of another court doesn't detract from that right. The Supreme Court in Vedanta held that's the wrong approach. If the anchor defendant is prepared to submit to the jurisdiction of another court, any risk of irreconcilable judgments becomes the choice of the claimants, not an inevitable problem caused by the domicile of the defendants. 
And then that risk of irreconcilable judgments looked at through that prism becomes merely a factor to weigh in the analysis rather than a trump card for the claimants. So is this some kind of passport then, enabling defendants to reverse forum shop without constraint? No. And the facts of Vedanta illustrate that nicely. On the facts of Vedanta itself, although the Supreme Court considered that Zambia was in many ways the appropriate forum for the litigation, it rejected the forum non-convenience challenge and that's because substantial justice wouldn't be available in um, Zambia, it found, due to funding and legal resource issues. So it's not a passport for defendants to do what they want, but it does substantially decrease the jurisdictional pull of an anchor defendant. And it will mean in non-Brussels cases that when we're representing defendant groups that want to resist the jurisdiction of the English courts, we'll be able to offer a constructive alternative by offering to submit to the jurisdiction of another court although that does mean you have to be prepared to have proceedings against you in the, uh, in the other court. So that's an aspect that reduces the weight of the anchor defendant. The second thread I think that one can pull out from Vedanta is what the good arguable case threshold which Helen has discussed requires specifically in the context of different entities in a corporate group where you've got this anchor and non-anchor defendant dynamic. Prior to Vedanta, there had been a couple of cases where parent companies had been found not to owe duties of care and negligence in respect of the conduct of their subsidiaries. And Vedanta was different in that respect on the facts of that case because the Supreme Court held there was a good arguable case that the anchor parent company had, um, had a duty of care and negligence. And I wonder whether, looking at that dynamic, what one needs to establish against the anchor defendant to get over the good arguable case threshold, there might be wider lessons to be drawn for commercial litigation generally, from commercial cartel litigation. As many of you will know, when a claimant wants to bring a claim for losses caused by a cartel, they'll typically want to bring claims against at least some of the cartel members, the people that were in the alleged smoky room, that really were in the cartel. But in global cartels, it's often a reality that none of the participants were actually domiciled in the UK. And an additional complication often arises in a jurisdictional sense where none of the claimants are domiciled in the UK because that reduces the chance that the losses were suffered in the UK. So to establish jurisdiction, claimants end up wanting to identify an anchor defendant domiciled in the UK to whom they can pin all the other claims against the frankly often true targets of the claim. For many years, there's been a debate about how far you can go in doing this and what the outer limits of liability are. And in 2003, Mr Justice Aikens, as he then was, gave a landmark ruling in Provemia and Aventis that there's at least a good arguable case against an anchor defendant that was a member of the same corporate group as the cartel participants and that sold the cartelised products. And since then, what we've seen in cartel litigation is claimants trying to push the boundaries incrementally wider and generally having a, generally having a measure of success in doing so. So, for instance, the first step really is 2011 um, in KME Yorkshire and Toshiba Carrier, where there's a good arguable case against a member, of a, um, a member of the same corporate group as a cartel member who acted as agent for someone that sold the cartelised product. So going slightly outside the scope of selling the product. In 2018, in Vattenfall against Prismian and NKT, a case in which I act for the claimants and Helen for the Prismian defendants, there was a good arguable case against an entity that hadn't sold the cartelised product at all, but had just been in the UK market performing a customer, um, customer liaison, a customer information function. So one sees the outer boundary of the anchor defendant concepts becoming ever wider. One then asks oneself, where does it stop on the spectrum of involvement? How wide can liability go? And um, one can read from, from a most recent case in this line, um, Media, Max, M Media Mark Saturn Holdings against Toshiba and Panasonic, that the outer bounds of liability may be broader still. In that case, where I was acting for an anchor defendant, I asked the judge rhetorically, clearly not sufficiently persuasively, because there was a good arguable case, but um, well, I asked where the line should be drawn on that spectrum. 
So, for example, could you be liable for a cartel if you were a member of the same corporate group as a cartel participant and happened to own the photocopier on which invoices for the cartelised product happen to be printed off? Would that be good enough? And if not, where is the line to be drawn? And the increasingly expansive line of jurisprudence in that particular area since Provimi illustrates that where different entities in corporate groups are concerned, the bar to establishing a good arguable case is in reality very low. On that topic, Vedanta may give further encouragement, I think, perhaps should give further encouragement to claimants outside the commercial cartel context who are attracted by English rules on disclosure, by our buoyant litigation funding market, and who are keen to have a go at establishing a good arguable case against an anchor defendant. They just need to bear in mind the risk that the remaining defendants will seek to stymie the English proceedings by purporting to submit to the jurisdiction of another foreign court. The topic that I will be discussing is reflexive application or reflexive effect under the Brussels and Lugano regimes. Sarah has already reminded you uh, of the Awuzu case and I am sure that many of you in this intimidatingly well-informed audience uh, will, remember that, will have remembered the first question uh, in that case, which, as Sarah has mentioned, was essentially whether the National Court had a discretion to stay proceedings uh, uh, where, um, where the, uh, on the basis of uh, forum non-convenience on the particular facts of that case. What um, fewer of you, I imagine, will remember is the second question that was posed by the Court of Appeal, which was the referring court uh, in Awuzu. And that second question was more general. It said, uh, in effect, it said whether the discretion to stay proceedings was excluded in all circumstances. And it made clear that, in fact, it had three particular circumstances in mind. Those three are up on the slide. The first of them is where you have an exclusive jurisdiction clause in favor of a non-contracting state, a third state. The second is where there are pending proceedings in a third state, lis alibi pendens. And the third is where you fall within the special subject matter of what was then Article 16 of the Brussels Regulation. So, for example, matters relating to land or patents or public registers and so on. And um, the reason that the Court of Appeal had those three particular circumstances in mind is not a coincidence. It's because um, in those three sets of circumstances, where there is, where if they had pertained to a contracting state to a member state, then they, the rule, the basic rule of domicile would have given way. And this is this question of whether that also extends to third states, to non-contracting states, is the question of whether the uh, Brussels and Lugano regimes have got reflexive application. This is the question of reflexive effect. Now, um, if some of you could, can recall uh, that second question, um, I doubt that any of you can recall the answer of the ECJ. And that is because there was no answer. Uh, the ECJ ruled that it decline, would decline to answer the second question because it, this was hypothetical. And indeed it was hypothetical because in Awuzu, there was no exclusive jurisdiction clause between Mr. Awuzu and Mr. Jackson in favor of the courts of Jamaica. There were no pending proceedings or that had already started in Jamaica, and none of the, it was not a case about any of the special subject matters. Now, uh, the, the, the fact that the court um, declined to answer it has, of course, not meant that academics and national courts have not had to grapple with this question. The predominant academic view is that 
the, the, both the, the Lugano and the Brussels regimes, should be, there should be reflexive application. There should be reflexive effect. And the reason for that is really summed up in a famous quote from Dr. Droz, who is a famous continental uh, a jurist who was also one of the original uh, draftsmen of the Brussels Convention. And what Dr. Droz said, and I summarize, is he said, if a French court is manifestly inappropriate uh, to rule on the validity of a German patent or a German lease, how is a French court any better placed to rule on the validity of a Japanese patent or an Argentinian lease? And really, the, the, the reasons of, the, the, these reasons of public policy for reflexive effect are actually overwhelming. The, the contrary argument, which is a minority view in the academic world, is that the terms of the Brussels Convention and the uh, well, regulation and the Lugano Convention uh, need to be cleaved to, literally. Because if you don't cleave to them literally, then certainty, legal certainty, is undermined. Now, um, this, I should emphasize that although the academics have been at it, this is far from an academic question because, I mean, the exclusive jurisdiction clauses in favor of the states of, of uh, United States, for example, are extremely common um, and we have to grapple with them all the time. And similarly, it's not at all uncommon to have pending proceedings in, uh, in non-contracting states. And yet, 14 years since Awuzu, there's still no judgment of the ECJ on the point. But the good news is that there have been two important English cases, very recent, um, that are um, bang on point in this area. And really what I'd like to do with you today is just briefly just to cons consider those cases and highlight them and bring one or two of their implications to your attention. Now the first one is the case of uh, Privat Bank and Kolomoisky, which is a judgment that was handed down just yesterday. Uh, now, the judgment contains a number of important determinations of law in the area of jurisdiction, not least in relation to Article 8, where the court has held that there is no, there is no sole object exception under Article 8. Um, there is only an exception for collusion. But, um, but I'm digressing, because I want to just um, discuss today the issue of reflexive effect and uh, the judgment in that respect. And um, now before Kolomoisky, uh, there had been a number of first instance judgments in the High Court going one way and the other on the question of reflexive effect. Some supported it, some against it, some uh, in, in favor of it, but only in certain respects. And um, although it is strictly obiter, this is the first fully reasoned judgment of the Court of Appeal on this point. And importantly, it supports reflexive effect under the Lugano Convention. And the Court of Appeal rejected Lord Panic's argument that the Convention was a comprehensive and exclusive code, and it accepted that a failure to give, a f give reflexive effect would lead to inconsistent judgments, which is uh, contrary to the purpose of the Lugano Convention. So that is the position in relation to the Lugano Convention. But one has to distinguish that with a position in relation to the Brussels regulation recast. Um, now the point to remember in relation to the recast regulation is that it introduced new provisions relating specifically to this point. Articles 33 and 34. And what those provisions do is to give a discretion to national courts to stay their proceedings where there is a list pendens in a third state. And the articles also impose two additional requirements. One is that the judgment in the third state should be capable of being recognized in the national court. And the second is that uh, the domestic court must be satisfied that a stay is necessary for the proper administration of justice. And that led um, Lord Justice Lewison in the Mittal and Mittal case to say that these new provisions meant that the European legislature had in effect now answered the unanswered question in Awuzu. And that is correct up to a point. 
because they have incorporated the reflexive principle when it comes to lis alibi pendens, when it comes to pending proceedings. But what the Brussels regulation recast is silent on is the position where there are no pending proceedings in a third state, but you nevertheless have an exclusive jurisdiction clause or you have one of the special subject matter jurisdictions, uh, such as a uh, decision of a, of a corporate uh, entity. And that leaves open the important question of whether ref the reflexive application um, still applies in those two sets of circumstances. And that brings me to the next very recent case, which is Gulf International and Aldwood, which came out in July of this year. Now, in that case, the defendant was domiciled here, and he sought to rely on a contract which had an exclusive jurisdiction clause in favor of Saudi Arabia, and there were no pending proceedings in Saudi Arabia. And John Kimball QC, sitting as a deputy high court judge, held that he had no power to enforce the exclusive jurisdiction clause or, therefore, to stay proceedings. He held, in essence, that the regulation recast with its Articles 33 and 34 had fully codified matters, and so there was just no room left for any aspect of the reflexive principle to operate, even in relation to otherwise valid exclusive jurisdiction clauses. The detailed reasoning of the judgment is impressive, uh, but it is also, I think, likely to be highly controversial. Not least because, and Sir Richard, please take note, it departs from the tentative view expressed in Dicey. But also, of course, because to say that a, a, a contract, an exclusive jurisdiction clause, freely entered into by two parties is completely unenforceable um, is, of course, a quite a counter, counterintuitive uh, proposition, I think, to most of our ears. And, of course, if it's correct, and the Court of Appeal is also correct in Privat Bank, then we have a striking difference between the Lugano Convention under which exclusive jurisdiction clauses would be enforceable and the supposedly new and improved Brussels regulation recast where they're not. Now, um, Charlotte is going to deal with uh, jurisdiction after Brexit in a moment, and I don't want to delay things uh, too long. Um, uh, but I'd like to make one observation um, about the implications of these cases um, in the post-Brexit period, assuming we have Brexit. And I understand it's still uh, touch and go at the moment. Um, so now you may be tempted to think, well, this is all very interesting, but um, we're going to leave reflexive effect well behind us when we leave the EU. But not so fast, because if we leave the EU then the UK is going to become, as far as other EU member states are concerned, it is going to become a third state. So if Gulf International and Aldwood represents the law, that gives rise to the slightly alarming possibility uh, that exclusive jurisdiction clauses in favor of, Engl of the English courts may be ignored in other EU countries. And the same would apply if a case involved uh, English special subject matter jurisdiction. Now, the position is alleviated by the fact that uh, the EU has ratified the Hague Convention on Choice of Court Agreements. Um, but it only alleviates matters because that will only at best apply to exclusive jurisdiction clauses entered into after October 2015. And it may not apply, indeed, until, uh, until uh, save in relation to exclusive jurisdiction clauses that have been entered into after we leave the EU. So um, that is only slight comfort. So if you have a client that has a dispute that is brewing, and the client would wish to rely on an English jurisdiction clause or on special subject matter jurisdiction, to obtain English jurisdiction, uh, and they want to avoid proceedings in another EU country, what do you do? Well, I would suggest that your client might be best off uh, commencing an action in England sooner rather than later, because then they would at least be sure that they can rely on Articles 33 
or 34 of the Brussels regulation recast uh, in order to invoke a stay on the grounds of pending proceedings. Uh, thank you very much. Over to Charlotte. Hi. So, as you have been promised, I have the joyful task of tackling the topic of Brexit and jurisdiction, which we couldn't really not talk about, um, although it is, frankly, still something of a thankless task, because it still remains one of speculation. I was really hoping we might have some sort of deal or, or, po or posited deal that I could talk to you about this morning, but that's not so. And, of course, it's made even harder when one has to engage in speculation of this type, immediately following such impressive and interesting analyses of concrete actual cases. So thanks, guys, for giving me the short straw. Um, so a possible deal, maybe, on the cusp of being announced, perhaps even tomorrow. Um, the topic of jurisdiction and judgments may not have been on the front pages in the context of those negotiations. Um, but such nuggets as has been revealed suggests, so far as I can tell, that the idea, if we do get a Johnson deal, is to retain the concept of the transition period from May's deal until December 2020. And the Johnson government insists, if it's still in power by then, that it will not extend that transition period any further. Now, it may be that members of the audience have further and better information, in which case do tell. But that means it is relevant to think about the transition period as set out in the May deal, because that might affect our lives for at least the coming year. Um, and Article 66 and 67 of the draft withdrawal agreement had made provision essentially for extending the current European regimes on jurisdiction and indeed choice of law until the end of the transition period. So the Brussels 1 recast regulation um, would continue to apply in the UK to proceedings instituted before the end of the transition period. Though note, um, so far as I can tell, that might also mean that the lease pendants provisions of the Brussels recast regulation would continue to have relevance even to proceedings issued after the end of the transition period because arguably those provisions would be engaged by the fact that proceedings had been commenced in EU member states beforehand. Um, choice of law is not the focus of this session, but the May deal also addressed choice of law by continuing the Rome 1 and Rome 2 regulations. Again, there are some interesting wrinkles that would no doubt be the subject of fascinating litigation if we get there. For example, the Rome 2 regulation is said to apply to non-contractual liability where the event giving rise to damage occurs before the end of the transition period. Whereas, of course, the substance of the Rome 2 regulation provides for the application of the law applicable of the country in which the damage occurs. So there's something of a disjunct between the transition provision and the content of the regulation. And that might imply that we have to look at the various jurisdiction cases on the place where the event giving rise to the damage occurred, so Bier and Nîmes de Potas and so on. Similarly, the transition, the, the withdrawal agreement contemplates the continued application of the current rules on recognition and enforcement of judgments, service of documents, taking of evidence, again, all until the end of the transition period. So, in the event that something is announced tomorrow, it may be that it will, I would imagine they've not been um, talking about changing these provisions, so that might give us an idea of what the next year and a bit looks like. But the May deal didn't deal with the post-transition period era, which was expected to be the subject of separate negotiation. So even if it, there is a Johnson deal, it leaves us quite in the dark about what will come next. And of course, there remains the looming possibility of no deal. So in an effort to keep this talk relevant for more than 24 hours, which may also coincidentally be the lifetime of Mr. Johnson's deal, who knows, um, I'm going to start by looking at the things which will stay the same on any view whatever flavour or type of Brexit we might have, before considering the deal or no deal scenarios. So what will say the same, and we've had some mention of these implications already, it's important to recognise that the Brussels regulation will continue to be relevant to UK parties, so that may not help us as UK lawyers who can't advise on it anymore, and we'll have to refer them to EU lawyers for advice. But commercially speaking, our clients will continue to be extremely affected by the implication of the Brussels regulation for some of the reasons we've been talking about. But broadly, UK claimants as third countries, uh, nationals, 
will still have access to EU courts under broadly the same rules. Um, and that's the finding of the Group Josie judgment of the Court of Justice in 2000, which was decided before Awusu. It's worth noting in passing that the question referred in that case actually asked about whether the defendant to a claim brought by a non-EU party could be protected by what was then the Brussels Convention. And that's because, as you all know, and as Sarah has emphasised, the Brussels regime starts with the proposition that defendants are protected by the domicile rule, subject, of course, to exceptions. But the idea is, as a defendant, you should be being sued in your home country. And so the Brussels regime arguably represents an attempt to control what might be thought to be the overreach of the common law, which I'll talk about later. So the court observed that that was the general rule, and it was expressed without reference to the claimant's domicile, although there were some specific provisions of the Brussels Convention where the claimant's domicile might be relevant, they were the exception rather than the rule. And it followed, said the Court of Justice, that the Brussels regime applied to all disputes where its rules were engaged, irrespective of the domiciles of the parties, despite the fact that, as the Paris Court d'Appel had observed in that case, this would necessarily entail extending EU law to non-member states, or at least persons based in non-member countries. And that might have the sorts of problems that Danny alluded to right at the end of his speech. Meanwhile, and despite the protection of the Brussels regime for the defendant's domicile, it's also the case that UK-based defendants might find themselves litigating in the EU further to the Brussels regime rules, again for some of the reasons that we've just been hearing about. First, it shouldn't be forgotten that there are quite broad rules on domicile in the Brussels regulation, in what's now Article 63 of Brussels recast. That provision supplies three alternative and cumulative definitions of domicile for a company, so it should be checked if your client might satisfy any one of those in another member state. Second, as looking at Article 6 of the Brussels recast regulation makes clear, there are various provisions of Brussels recast which apply even to defendants who aren't domiciled in a member state, as again Danny has alluded to, but Article 6 lists them out. So Article 6 gives you your gateway out of Brussels recast if you're not an EU domiciled <coughs> defendant, but it shuts that gate in certain circumstances. Um, in particular in relation to consumers, uh, certain employment situations, but also situations arising in the context of exclusive jurisdiction and jurisdiction agreements. So perhaps none of this is very promising for English lawyers, but at least so far it looks a bit like the status quo, albeit with the risk of creating the sorts of problems that Danny just adverted to. The second thing that will still be the same is the UK courts, of course. So in the face of the uncertainties created by Brexit and the moves by various European jurisdictions to create user-friendly, English-speaking commercial courts, um, there's a sort of trend I've noticed of uh, speeches that focus on the virtues of the UK legal system. So judges and ex-judges um, very valiantly flying the flag for our system and explaining uh, why it is that actually all the reasons why this is an attractive jurisdiction to bring commercial disputes to will remain the case and are actually pretty much unaffected by Brexit. Um, so I've looked in particular at speeches of Sir Christopher Clarke given early this year that some of you may have come to. And the Chancellor of the High Court has also given a number of valuable speeches in this regard. And the first thing that I think it's important to emphasise they talk about is that English law and users of the English legal system both benefit from a surfeit of high quality commercial practitioners. So can I please invite you to stay and enjoy a drink on Chambers this evening and congratulate each other on what a wonderful job you're all doing. Accompanying that, of course, are some of the factors mentioned by Sarah. She talked about the litigation funding market being particularly robust in the UK, and that again surrounds um, the UK legal market. Second, having lauded the practitioners, I should mention the judges, um, they're not only excellent to their jobs, of course, but they're also of high integrity. Both of those speeches I've just mentioned of Sir Christopher Clarke and Sir Geoffrey Voss note various surveys conducted by the European networks of councils for the judiciary, which reveal, actually, I, I was surprised, they reveal a distressingly high incidence of a perception in various other member states that judges might be subjected to inappropriate pressure or might even accept bribes, whereas the UK scores a clean bill of health in both regards. Finally is the suitability of the English common law, both substance and procedure, for the resolution of commercial disputes. Now, it should be said that in some respects, EU law is superior to English common law, as I would suggest it undoubtedly is in relation to choice of law. And where that's so, we can just 
keep it. So um, it, it looks like the intention at least may be to keep the Rome 1 and Rome 2 regulations because of course they don't depend on reciprocity. Um, we can just keep them and we can take account of CJU decisions or not as suits. But leaving aside that example, English common law as applied in commercial cases is well developed and it has a long history of appealing to business people and will continue to do so. Its flexibility, its system of precedent, its rules around disclosure, also mentioned by Sarah, provide a level of certainty and predictability but flexibility that parties are still likely to want to use. Um, and finally, arbitration, of course, is not within the scope of the Brussels recast regulation. If anything, it's slightly trammeled in by it, because um, although it's outside the scope, to the extent that litigation concerns arbitration, obviously, famously, um, it's subject to restrictions. So, in principle, Brexit has no effect on London status as an arbitral centre, and might even unleash it. Um, and while this talk focuses on jurisdiction rather than arbitration, so I'm not going to go into that, I do note recent comments by Dame Elizabeth Gloucester talking about the symbiotic relationship between litigation and arbitration. Indeed, some 25% of cases commenced in the commercial court are related to arbitration in some way. So the continued importance of, of arbitration is good for litigation as well. All right, so that's... Maybe not the good news, but the reassuring news. I'm trying to keep it light. Next up, of course, is what will change. So what's going to be different? And the answer to that, of course, is it depends on the what's, why's, and the ifs of any deal. So the government has published a no-deal note, um, which observes businesses, individuals, and legal practitioners, that's us, will need to consider how these rules interact with domestic rules of relevant EU countries to determine how jurisdiction and cross-border disputes should be established and whether any judgments should be enforced, which is really helpful. Um, so <laughs> other entities, including the Law Society, have published some slightly more useful document documents, which obviously I commend to you, but ultimately, as I started out by saying, it's really all still a matter of speculation. The No Deal paper does, however, usefully confirm the UK's intention to take the necessary steps to rejoin the 2005 Hague Convention on Choice of Court Agreements. Um, and of course, there are Hague Conventions for service of documents and taking of evidence. And the UK did, in fact, ratify the 2005 Hague Convention in December 2018, which means that the usual three-month time period between ratification of that instrument and its coming into force is not a problem. But that convention is not a panacea, essentially for the reasons you've heard from Danny. There's a big problem concerning whether it will apply in relation to contracts entered into between October 2015 and whenever Brexit Day is. It won't protect contracts entered into before that date in any event. It only protects exclusive jurisdiction agreements. So if you have an asymmetric jurisdiction agreement, um, and it, sorry, it doesn't protect asymmetric jurisdiction agreements, so that's not going to help you. It also doesn't help with enforcement of judgments. Um, Professor Adrian Briggs, in a penetrating lecture given to Combo last, Comba last year, um, gave some possibly reassuring comments in this regard. He noted that the usual understanding is that only the state where a judgment is proposed to be enforced can make um, orders supporting enforcement under the current EU regime. Whereas if the EU regime falls away, the English court could take much more control of its procedure in that regard, and as the court of adjudication could also make orders supporting the enforcement of its judgments, for example, orders as to investigation and orders as to disclosure. He also says very confidently that um, it's very likely that parties hold assets in London if you've obtained an English judgment against them. I'm not, however, aware of any... Uh, um, actual evidence in that regard as to what the position is, though it can perhaps be said that a party who is trying to evade an English judgment by hiding assets probably doesn't have assets in the EU either. But again, I don't, I'm not aware of any facts or sort of proper exploration in this regard, so we don't really know. But we probably can say that an English judgment will carry weight wherever it's sought to be enforced abroad, and so some of the doom and gloom on this score is a little overstated. There's also, of course, the question of transitional provisions dealt with under the withdrawal agreement, but we simply don't know the position if there is no deal. Um, so reversion to the common law then could well be possible. There are all these problems and difficulties that would have to be worked out, but it may not be the end of the world. Um, the, 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 there's a, a traditional perception that I mentioned earlier that the common law is a system that involves some overreach that the Brussels regime trammeled. Um, and it's probably worth just commenting that that view is now old-fashioned. Um, in particular, as Lord Sumption commented in Abela and Bardarani, the international nature of 
uh, common uh, sort of modern um, commercial disputes I mean that the use of the sort of pejorative word exorbitant in relation to service out jurisdiction is no longer justified. And it's for these sorts of reasons um, that Professor Adrian Briggs, in his uh, speech that I mentioned, talks about the common law as being loose-limbed rather than long-armed, which I rather like. And that loose-limbed nature of the common law may actually make uh, the UK uh, an increased, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, may give the UK an increased attractiveness as a venue for commercial disputes. And we may avoid some of the more rigid strictures of the Brussels regime, again, which some of which we've just been he uh, hearing about. So one problem, for example, is if you've brought in a defendant to the UK on the basis they committed a tort here, there's a question under EU law, there's a limitation under EU law about the quantity of damage that you can claim for limited to damage that's in the EU, and the common law could open up that kind of problem. We could avoid the strictures of a WUSU, there are more generous joinder rules. Um, so for all of those various reasons, it's probably right to say that actually under the common law there would be broader jurisdiction of the UK courts, albeit not exorbitant jurisdiction. Again, looking at the service out provisions, it would give us jurisdiction in cases that um, the EU courts wouldn't allow, so contracts governed by English law can be heard in the UK. Um, under the new section 4A, future claims on the same or closely connected facts can, under circumstances, be heard in London courts. And again, there's no need or obligation to decline jurisdiction in favour of an EU member state unless there's an exclusive jurisdiction agreement under the Hague Convention. So, arguably, more jurisdiction for English courts, that might be good for English lawyers. The alternative, of course, is to enter into some kind of agreement. And here I'll wrap up because I really am just speculating. Um, but just very quickly, the options are something that looks a bit like Lugano, something that looks a bit like the Denmark-EU agreements. Um, there's been some suggestion that the Brussels Convention could revive itself automatically, but that's obviously not a long-term solution in any event because it only applies to 15 member states. And anyway, if we're going to have something like that, we might as well just agree it, it seems to me. Additionally, if we're going to have something like that, we might as well agree something better than Lugano because, of course, Brussels recast represents an improvement over Brussels 1. And again, one would think we would want to keep the improved uh, terms that are in the Brussels recast regulation, which the, e which the UK had a very significant hand in negotiating. So the downside of an agreement like this is probably fairly obvious. It's the continued role of the CJEU while there may be no real objection in principle to an obligation to take into account the judgments of the CJEU, again, as Professor Briggs says, what are you going to do? Just ignore them. Um, at the same time, it does mean that you're stuck in a regime which, as I say previously, the UK had a great deal of influence in designing and now doesn't do so. Um, they'd be unable to make a reference or obliged to make references in circumstances where they might not want to do so. Um, and more cogently, though, if there is a problem with the regime, for example, if it's decided that Brussels recast should be corrected to correct some of the problems Danny has identified, the UK wouldn't be able to participate in the reform of that regime in the future and so would lose the control that it has. The upsides, of course, are stability, continuation, continuation and uniformity. And it's for those reasons that entering into agreement of this type has been recommended by lots of very respectable parties, including the Bar Council. So that's the end of my speculation. As I say, that my main invitation to you is please enjoy a drink later and at least feel that you yourselves are a good part of the current system and if we don't know how it's going to continue. Thank you.